guys. I'm Taylor. I am a, yeah, I'll just do Taylor Spiel. I'm a junior. I'm now a GSAS major. I was formerly a chemical engineering major. I am technically, I'm like e arts concentration technically, but I'm like unofficially a music slash audio concentration. And I want to talk to you about music theory. Um, I made this entire PowerPoint under the assumption that no one knew anything about music theory. So if you do have a background in music theory or music performance, I'm sorry, you are going to have to sit through this. Um, okay, so whenever I take a music theory course, they always started by explaining to me, or like getting into that like philosophical discussion of what music is. And this is what music is according to the Oxford Dictionary. Um, I think it's a little too specific, especially considering like the last hundred years or so of music history and how a lot of this definition has gotten thrown out the window. So this is my definition of music. <laughs> um, and so in order to explain uh, as much about the most basic music theory that I can possibly get into, I'm going to look at this and tell you, show you guys how to read it. Um, now, at first glance, does anyone know what this is? Because if you do, don't say anything. <laughs> yes. Well, that's what I mean. If you know what song it is, don't say anything. Okay, so um, I'm going to start to explain how you read this with the time signature. It's 3-4, which is also known as like waltz tempo because all waltzes are written in either 3-4 or it's like bouncier cousin 6-8. And the way time signatures work is they indicate how the rhythm is counted. Uh, there, it indicates a certain amount of beats per measure and which type of note has one beat in the measure. And in case you're wondering what a measure is or what a quarter note is, that's a measure. Um, it's that little square. It's indicated by the little lines. And these are different types of notes. Um, their quote unquote value in rhythmically is determined by the meter. And a half note is always held for half the value of a whole note. A quarter note is always held for half the value of a half note, and so on. So the next thing I want to talk about is key signature, which in most sheet music would be located between this curly ampersand, as Mary put it. It's actually a treble clef, um, which basically indica indicates a higher note range, like higher frequencies, um, higher pitches. Um, in it would be in between the treble clef and the time signature, but in this case, because there is no indication of a key signature in the form of a sharp symbol, which is the one that looks like a hashtag, or the flat symbol, which is the one that looks like a lowercase b. Um, we know that we're in C major. Don't worry about the rest of this. The circle of fifths is extremely helpful, but it's also kind of complicated if you're coming into this without any knowledge of music theory. What you need to know for now is that the circle of fifths is extremely useful in figuring out what key signature you're in. And because we have no sharps or flats in the key signature, we are in C major, or A minor, but I can tell you right now that this isn't a major key. So these are the notes that are in C major. And that is where they are located on the staff, so you know which note is which. And you can also assign certain values to them that allow you to use interval relationships, which I'll get into a bit later, in order to figure out what, um, which pitch is which and be able to sing through it fluidly. You've probably seen this before. And you may have written it off as that silly song from The Sound of Music. This is solfege. It is the, the do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do system is referred to as solfege. And as someone who does a lot of vocal performance, I live and breathe by it because it allows me to read music very easily and figure out how melodies go without having ever heard them before. So the way that you use the solfege system is with intervals. Um, on a keyboard, on a piano, each octave is divided into 12 semitones. And uh, how do I describe? There are different values of uh, interval, and I described each of them there. It's just a certain amount of space between two notes and how their frequencies are related to one another. Um, in the case of uh, perfect intervals, they usually have a very nice frequency ratio. So we're getting into some science there. Um, for octaves, the zero semitone is exactly half the frequency of the 12 semitone. Um, and then like perfect fourths and perfect fifths also have certain specific, very nice, even um, ratios. Like I don't remember what exactly what they are. One of them is 2 thirds, I believe. Um, so that's how that works. A semitone is also referred to as like a half step or a minor second. And um, a major second can also be referred to as a whole step. 
which actually relates back to major scales, because the way that you do major scales is um, different types of scales are determined by the different order of half and whole steps that go through. And if I remember correctly, a major scale goes whole step from C to D, whole step from D to E, half step from E to F, whole step from F to G, whole step from G to A, whole step from A to B, and half step from B to C. Whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. That's a major scale. Okay, so, hmm? I honestly do not know the answer to that. I remember reading something about the way the sulfide system was formed, and it was mostly just some very like esoteric stuff, like so is so used to be soul, which is the sun. It was some weird symbolic stuff that <laughs> they just decided settled on. The idea is that it's just a one-syllable sound that you can make in order to indicate what sulfide pitch you're on. Um, so yeah, and when you play intervals together, you get harmonies in the form of dyads, or just intervals. Um, and there are t two general types of intervals. There are consonant intervals and there are dissonant intervals. The consonant intervals are the ones that sound nice, and the dissonant intervals are the ones that sound not nice, and they're the ones that you usually hear in like horror movies or music that is intended to make you feel uncomfortable, whereas consonant is like the nice, happy-sounding stuff. Um, uh, technically, perfect fourths right there in the middle can be consonant or dissonant depending on the scenario, but in like really old traditional forms of music, they're technically considered a dissonant interval, so I just labeled it as such. Um, yeah, and then when you start building up to threes, you get triads or chords, and these are all diatonic triads, which I don't know the exact definition of, but the way I understand it, you take the first note of the chord and then you just build up by going every other line or every other space depending on what the bottom note is related to. And in a scale, each, um, each pitch has a certain quote unquote role where like the first pitch, in this case C because we're in C major, is the tonic and then you just go from there. They all have different names that refer to them and you also can go by numbers. So you end up with a certain system of chords where um, you, uh, and which allows you to create chord progressions, which is how you get different feelings out of the progression of music over time. The most typical way to write music is to progress from the tonic. So you start on a one chord, or the tonic chord, and then you progress to um, usually like a four chord or a six chord, something that's considered a predominant chord. And then you can either move on to the five or seven chord, which is considered the dominant chord. And the dominant chord is hard to explain, but the general idea of it is it sounds unresolved. It sounds like it wants to move to another chord. And so you usually end that progression by going back to the tonic, which makes you kind of go, ah, oh, like the song sounds resolved and you get like that nice tension and release cycle that is very important to music having an emotional impact. So. Back to this, you can see these are the, so this, back to our little melody that I mentioned earlier. Um, you can see the different um, pitches that they are, the specific notes. We start on a B compared to this. And you can also see the solfege tones. And so, uh, I don't remember the exact, I, can't, I don't have perfect pitch, so I cannot sing a B off the top of my head. Thank you, <laughs> that is a B. So in this, you can read it. You can just go through and sing the solfege on each note. And so like, if it starts on T, then you can jump up to T, Do, Re, T, Re, La, So, La, T, Re, La, T, Re, La, So, Re, Do, T, La. Like that. Um, the reason I know the rhythm is because <laughs> the reason I know the rhythm is because of the three-four meter and the different note values. So you know that you hold that first B for two beats because it is a half note, which has double the value of a quarter note, which in this case has one beat. So it has two beats. So you hold the B for two beats, and then you hold the D for one beat, and then you move on to the next measure, and you hold 
the A for two beats, and then you hold the G and the A for a half a beat each. And that's how the rhythm works. And I'm sure you guys all know this song. I just put it in there in case no one recognized it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so that is my summer, that is my basic music theory tutorial, and I know I touched on some very simple and some very complicated ideas because it's very hard for me to both talk simultaneously about very general simple music theory and what you can do with it when actually writing music. So, does anyone have any questions? Okay. Okay, so how, how now I have to relate this back to video game music. So what I did was I went through a bunch of my favorite video game soundtracks and pointed out a bunch of features in certain tracks of those soundtracks that I thought made them interesting and made them work very well in the context of their games and things like that. So if you'll indulge me as I talk about some of my favorite video game soundtracks for a few slides. Um, first thing I'm gonna talk about is Transistor, which is a game I'm very, very fond of. Um, so, Transistor has a couple of weird time signatures for a few of its tracks. Most, the most common time signatures are either a multiple of two or a multiple of three. But, which like 4-4 four, four is probably the most common time signature you will ever see. Most songs use 4-4. Four, 3-4 four. Four gets used occasionally um, when you want a slightly different sound. Sometimes if you want it to sound dance-like, you use 3-4 because that's the waltz tempo. Um, uh, two two is just a faster version of four four, um, but then there are weird ones like five four or seven eight. Yes. Can you just like reiterate what the second number in the time signature? Oh yes, it indicates which type of note gets one beat per in the in the time signature. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. So the question was to reiterate the second note in the tempo in time signatures. Uh, second number, I can't talk. Um, yeah, so in the case of, like, I'll just use the one on the screen, 5-4, a quarter note gets one beat because the, what, what the number represents is like the bottom number of the fraction that the note is named after. So a quarter note is represented by a four, a half note is represented by a two, whole note is represented by a one. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so the way that a, um, a couple of these tracks are in 5-4 meter, at least partially, so they have five beats per measure, and the way you hear a measure in music, like without actually looking at the sheet music, is you usually listen for when it sounds like a certain phrase has ended and a new one has begun or repeated. I used gateless in this example because every time the measure ends, the phrase loops, so you'll be able to hear uh, where each measure starts and ends, and and you should be able to theoretically count the five beats that are in each measure. So I'll just play that. <laughs> In circles is also in 5-4 meter, but only in the verses. In the chorus, it switches to 3-4 because you can change time signatures mid-song if you feel like it. for transistor, which is a chromatic, which is talking about the chromatic scale. What the chromatic scale is, is literally just increase, is a scale that literally just always increases by semitone or half step. Like, remember how I described that the major scale is like a combination of uh, whole, whole steps and half steps in a different order. Chromatic scale is just all half steps. And for this one, I have a track called Impossible, when the full version with all the instruments sounds like this. Um, but what I find the most interesting about this track is the bass line, which is really cool, just 
in general, and also uses a lot of half-step movement, just chromatic scale up and down to um, create a very interesting, uh, almost it's almost a melody line, except it's in the bass. So moving on, uh, if you have spoken to me in the last like six months, you probably know that Bloodborne is my new favorite game of all time. <laughs> um, yeah, right? So I felt the need. To, I <laughs> uh, so I wanted to talk about how it uses um, dissonant uh, interval harmony to create a very um, unsettling atmosphere, and it does it very well. So in this song, which is a choral chant called Hail the Nightmare, there are a lot of tritone harmonies. What I want you to listen to is the very last note that both the sopranos, which are the high female voices, and the altos, which are the low female voices, sing, because it creates a tritone, which sounds very jarring. Um, yeah, um, I also wanted to bring up the fact that Bloodborne soundtrack is created live. It, it was recorded by an orchestra and a choir in like a some church or big kind of open building in London, um, which is really cool because uh, next-gen consoles can actually handle the amount of storage space required for live music recordings, and it's awesome. A lot of, a lot of. Um, like, f for most of video game history, uh, you usually had to create music digitally in one way or another just because of the storage space required to hold live recordings, like high quality live recordings, but we've been moving away from that more and more, and it's really cool to hear, especially for me, who's been in choirs and stuff for a lot. And I just threw this, I just threw this one in because it's really cool, and I thought it really showed just what exactly you can do with a live recording of like an orchestra and a choir together. Oh, damn it. and very um, just interesting and in certain scenarios in a video game that can work extremely well. Okay, and as you saw, because I accidentally hit enter, I want to talk about Journey because it is unique in its, uh, it's a very unique soundtrack, not only because um, it's, uh, it, it's mostly live, uh, it was mm, recorded by a live string orchestra and I think five live soloists for cello, viola, harp, flute, and serpent, which is an odd brass instrument that you don't need to worry about. Um, but uh, some of the uh, later, the soundtracks, uh, the tracks later in the game, like as I mentioned there, use aleatoric music, as I learned by watch, sitting through Austin Wintry's commentary on the score, which is a like hour-long video on YouTube where he literally just plays the entire score and uses YouTube's annotations to write comments over it. And I highly recommend watching it if you're interested in video game music or Journey soundtrack specifically, because not only is Austin Wintry a really cool guy, but it's it's he just provides a lot of insight on like how you go about creating video game music and like what kind of interesting techniques you can use or think about using and we don't get a lot of that like it's hard enough to find like original scores for video game soundtracks and so this was just very nice information to have and it was really cool of Wintry to do that but anyway aleatoric music um, it uses it allows the performers to kind of act at random which leaves which in like a if you're in a performance setting means that every time you perform it it'll sound slightly different but in the case of the in the case of the recordings used for journey it creates a very um frenetic sound like you'll hear the strings just kind of like jittering all over the place Uh, un 
unsettling, very dark. This is Nadir plays during one of the uh, most uh, intense parts of the game. All right, uh, I believe the next one is Professor Layton. Yes. I really love Professor Layton's soundtrack. It uses, um, I can't really speak about specific theory techniques used in it, but I can talk about the instrumentation and the genre that they channeled when they were writing the soundtrack. They go for uh, world jazz, which is awesome, and they use instruments like piano, violin, and accordion, and it, it just works so well within the atmosphere of the game because if you've never played a Professor Layton game, most of the locations are either London or like rural European <laughs> villages. and it's just the feel that it creates through the music in relation to the setting is just excellent. And I want to show you an excerpt from one of my favorite tracks. From the game. in the jazz genre. You've got a whole bunch of instruments just kind of going off into like almost improv sounding solos. Uh, it started with the accordion, then the violin, then the piano. Okay, and last one I want to talk about is Near, which is a game that not many people have played, but I'm very, very fond of its soundtrack. Um, it uses vocals in an interesting way. Um, as you probably know, most video game soundtracks are just instrumental. When they use, uh, vocals are usually used for extremely climactic parts because they, if you have very distinct vocals, like vocals where you want the audience to become kind of distracting, in that, were, that applies to both video games and like other uh, visual media like movies. Uh, and, but um, in this case, there are vocals in almost every track on the soundtrack, and they're all meant to be have more or less distinct lyrics that you can make out. But the catch is that the lyrics don't actually really mean anything. They're all, they're, they're phonetic, uh, basis is all on like modern day languages, but they're um, not actually those languages. So I wanted to show you two of these tracks. One of them, this first one, is has words that are meant to sound like Gaelic, but they're not actually Gaelic. <laughs> that are meant to sound like English, but not. And the first time I heard this, I was like, this is almost kind of terrifying. Because <laughs> like, it does, this, the sounds that are made sound a lot like English syllables, but they make absolutely no sense, and it's really jarring. <laughs> Okay, so the question was, what do I want to see in video game soundtracks in the future of the game industry that I want to make? Okay. 
Um, well, uh, I've noticed more and more that game soundtracks tend to be leaning toward um, lean, uh, kind of like progression of music in tandem with the game. So what they'll do is like um, during a boss fight, if uh, like the the track on the soundtrack itself sounds like one continuous thing, but what they'll do is in game, uh, if you're in like a boss fight, for example, and you uh, if it's a multi-phase boss fight, they'll play a certain loop of a certain section of that track for phase one, and then when you move on to phase two, it progresses to, fa to a second section of the song and loops that until you progress to phase three and so on, um, which I think is really cool. I think it allows, it reinforces the change that's happening and it um, just, it can make the emotional impact of that change much more, um, uh, give it a lot more weight. Uh, other things, um, procedurally generated music is starting to become a thing. Um, the addition and subtraction of layers in re of like layers of instruments in relation to what the player is doing has become a thing. Um, I didn't talk about it much, but um, Transistor does that occasionally. It'll add like um, percussion lines that it'll take away the percussion line in a track when you're not in combat and it'll add it again when you are things like that it may just play like a single instrument line like take the bass line of a track and just play that when there's not a lot going on and they want you to focus on what's actually happening on screen rather than what you're hearing um uh there was a game there was an indie game on steam i think it's called vessel it it also does that it adds uh it adds layers of instruments depending on um how you're doing in like puzzles and things like that mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. I'll get off. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like you all to picture a world where we didn't have the storage space to record orchestras. <laughs> Uh, in fact, uh, disregard all, m disregard MIDI, disregard Redbook Audio CD, think back to a time when all we had literally was uh, a very limited sound palette. Imagine, imagine the concept of limitation, and then imagine all the constrictions with storage space. Uh, imagine all the frustrations that must have occurred, uh, because you're about to reawaken a lot of those frustrations. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Taylor. Thank you very much, Taylor, for uh, doing a wonderful first half with um, music theory because I, uh, my skill set is quite limited in, in the theory range, but I do know how to use Famitracker, and that's what we're going to be learning today. Uh, Famitracker is a music sequencer that represents music on a timeline with channels. Um, basically, that means that we can see the different instruments, if you will, that are playing um, in the different parts of the screen, and then we can see those notes laid out like a grid. That way we can see the progression of things and we can see, we can really be um, very detailed in picking out specific parts and tailoring them just so that it's just the way we want them. So I'd like you all to open up Famitracker if you've downloaded that, hopefully you have. Um, I'm going to open up my copy as well. Um, all right, so um, it's, it's a little crazy, but uh, let's try to talk about some navigation first. So you can move around with a mouse right here. You can click on different parts of, uh, of the screen, and uh, you can tell that that little gray rectangle there is your cursor. It's moving with uh, the selection that you're clicking on. And right now our, store, our window is a little bit limited in what we can work with, but um, we'll expand that eventually. Um, I want you to note that if you double click, you can select an entire, uh, you can select an an entire instrument for that frame. Um, and that way, if I need to quickly control C and control V to copy and paste something over to a different section of a song, maybe I need to highlight everything in order to replace all the instruments or decrease its octave, whatever such may be. Um, just uh, modify that how you choose. You can also use the arrow keys to move around left or right. Um, that's also good. And um, one last thing is that you can double click uh, right over here to select everything. That's pretty cool. You can uh, double click. Uh, you can double click to select a frame. If I had more than one frame, I could jump to one, two, three, four, five, etc. Um, but uh, that's basically navigation. Um, don't be afraid to don't be afraid to scroll around with a mouse wheel either. So up top, we've got speed, tempo, rows, and frames. So 
Um, basically, speed and tempo are a little, uh, they're, they have a lot in common with, with how they're used in Fam Tracker, but generally the rule of thumb is that speed is used for large changes and tempo is for more detailed changes. As an example, uh, you don't have to follow along with me, this is just an example for now, but I'm just gonna hit this add instrument button right here. That creates a new instrument that we can see, it's called new instrument, and I'm going to type in some notes. Let's see, uh, we hit space, by the way, to, to when it turns red, you can see that it's in recording mode, and now see how when I go like, when I have an instrument selected, and I'm pressing keys on the keyboard, Z to M for now, Z, X, C, V, B, and M, whatever you choose, uh, you can hear notes being played. That's using that instrument that I've selected. If we hit space and it turns red, we can start typing. We can type them in, and that's how you lay down music on, on Famitracker. And now if we hit enter, we can take a listen. Oh man, I'm good. Um, uh, okay, so now let's let's take this sequence. Everybody listen to the, the speed in which it's being played. Great. Let's turn the speed up to three, because Famitracker goes speed in reverse. Pretty reasonable difference, right? Um, so now, uh, again, one more time. That's six. Let's turn tempo up to 160. Uh, see how it's a more uh, smaller change. So if you really had to fine tune something, I'd recommend doing it with tempo. Uh, if you have a big change, I'd recommend doing it with speed. Um, generally, you can listen to a song if you're doing a cover and see uh, it's about this fast, and then you can start putting down some notes and then trying to get the general feel, and then you can lock onto the specific tempo as you go. Um, okay, speed, tempo, rows, and frames. Rows, um, rows are these uh, grid spaces, if you will. They're, they're spaces that we have for a note to be played or rest to be played. Um, I'm going to change it right here to 10, and then look carefully. See how it got smaller? That's, the, that's one measure, if you will, of Famine Tracker music. Um, Frames are those measures. Um, if you look up here, I can see I, I just hit the add frame button right here, right up here at the top, and now frames are two. That means that if I scroll down from frame one, it goes to frame two. Look up at the top left-hand corner up where it's all the zeros are up here. You can also see it going from uh, zero to zero to zero, zero, zero to zero, one. Now, one thing that might get a little confusing is that um, if I type in because these are listed as 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, that means that um, it's still on the 0, 0 frame for each specific instrument. Um, this may seem a little unclear, but let me try to explain it. If I type in a C here, um, see how it's 0, 0 at both pulse 1 for the first and second frames? If I click down here, that means that it's the exact same note because it's, it's literally copying over the same frame that existed uh, zero, zero exists for at any time you put zero, zero for pulse one in anything, it's still going to be the same. So if I delete it down here, it'll also go away in pulse two. Uh, so basically, uh, if I do this, where I change the frame right here, um, now we've got different frames. So I can do, well, so I can see, do C, D, E, and D, E, F. Um, so now we've got a difference. Does that make sense? Different, fr uh, you can reuse a frame like that. Now it's the same. But if you change it, it'll be different. So um, if you find yourself that certain songs are replaying certain parts, check your frames. It might be due to that. So um, so that's that. OK. Um, great. OK, first section is all set. Great. Um, top speed, rows, frames. Right. So um, we're going to add a couple button shortcuts um, that are going to be helpful. Everybody go to File and then Configuration right here. Um, file Configuration. And then, um, this is how I do it. You might find other button shortcuts, but I find that these are useful. You, I recommend changing uh, note cut to the number one, uh, the number one on your keyboard. So we just go like that and hit one. Um, and then uh, we're gonna go to shortcuts. I'll repeat myself in a minute. And uh, we're going to go to decrease and increase octave. Oh, I guess it didn't copy over. Okay, so decrease and increase octave. I put, whoa. I put decrease octave as, uh, as as left bracket next to the P key, and I put increase octave as uh, the right bracket, just because that's handy for me, in my opinion. Um, so I'll repeat myself one more time. We go to File Configuration, and then we can set one right here, one shortcut right there, and we can go to Shortcuts and enter another one right there. So basically, if everybody looks up at the very top, um, 
right up here uh, where it says f uh, octave, up here, if we hit the bracket keys now, it should, yep, it's jumping between 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. You can make those go up and down. Octaves are a series of eight notes that uh, help us structure music and how high or low basically the notes are being held. Hi, Spencer. Um, right here. Do you see that number? Now, here, Spence, take a look. Um, the question was, where do we find the octave uh, location? It's right here, Spencer. And if you see me hitting the bracket keys, you can see that number changing. I'm going to demonstrate what that means. So here's octave zero. This is a C. Pretty, nope, sorry. Too low. It cut out. There we go. There's a C. Um, octave one, octave two, octave three, four. So it's just, uh, octaves are a good way to measure how high or low your thing is. Uh, how, how high or low your instrument is being used at the moment. Um, explain that octave. Yep, I did that already. Okay, so um, let's talk about the different instruments that we have right here. Um, we're, I'm going to go ahead and make a blank instrument again. We'll, the next step is to make instruments, so don't worry about that yet. But this is just a dummy instrument that I'm going to use in as, as an example. Excuse me. Um, so let's try pulse. Pulse is, uh, pulse is what we call a square wave. Um, it's what we use for melody and harmony in most NES games. It sounds like this. Nope, bad, 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 bad. Bad. Okay, sorry. <laughs> wow, I never had that happen before. Um, so we use those often for melody and harmony. Melody is what you hear um, in... It's the main voice of a piece. So for Mario, it would be di -di 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 -di. that's melody. It's the thing that you hum. Thank you, Ian. Um, harmony is uh, do 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 do. It's what harmonizes with the melody. Uh, and uh, yeah, um, triangle is bass. If any of you have ever seen an electric bass or a, an upright bass, it's the same instrument. Um, it gives us a on Family Tracker. It gives us a very low, um, warm humming sound. Uh, we call it the triangle. Um, Um, yeah, that's pretty good. Um, and if you turn it up to higher octaves, um, you'll often hear a lot of Famous Tracker people using it as sort of a flute. <laughs> Anybody? No? Okay, he's got it. Um, so uh, I think it's a it's a lovely instrument. And also, take a look at the take a look right here, uh, right up there in the in the information. You can see the waveform. That's a square. That's a triangle. Hey, it makes sense, right? It's shaped like, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> so right here is right here is noise. This is literally white noise. Have any of you ever turned on your uh, TV to a dead channel? You'll hear something like, uh, yeah, we use those for drums. Um, uh, because we can use that and then segment it and separate it into cracks and pops and, and really percussive sounding stuff and that's what gives us literally drums because it, what is what is a drum set but hitting things right um, in different ways um, if any of you have played contra some of the some of the noise sounds will <laughs> sound like the bass explosions <laughs> yeah same thing um, wonderful uh, also if any of you have played the Mega Man games you'll some of that stuff will sound familiar because we often use the noise for things like gun sound effects or like like jumping when you hit the ground. And that's also why if Mega Man fires too many weapons at one time in the old games, the drums will cut out of the songs because we literally don't have enough space to play two sounds at the same time. Um, fun fact. And DPCM is sampling. If any of you, do any, have any of you played Super Mario Brothers 3 and you heard that timpani, do, 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 dum, dum, that, that kettle drum? We didn't make that in Famitrack or, or with the 2A03, that's impossible, but we recorded a recording of that timpani being hit. Bless you. Um, bless you. Um, and we used that recording and played it back as an instrument. Um, most of the time that's used for drums, but I've seen it being used as sampled electronic bass. I've seen it used in a variety of ways. Um, in Tecmo Bowl, that's the referee going touchdown, hot, 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 or you know, whatever. Um, we can record voices. I throw a lot of things into my covers of character voices, like I'm really feeling it, or you're, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> But I'll show you that later. Um, right, so let's create an instrument, everybody. Um, I'm assuming that your thing is blank. If not, just delete whatever you got. And we're going to hit the Add Instrument right here. New Instrument. Yay. Um, let's name it uh, uh, anybody? Uh, noodles. Noodles it is. Thank you. So we've got the instrument Noodles. 
right here. It should say zero, zero, because that's the first instrument you made. If you ever made another one, that's okay, too. But let's double, hi, Mary. Have you made it? Oh, oh I'm sorry. Right here in this field, um, do you see what's being highlighted right here? Yeah, you're going to want to type in noodles or something. Everybody, you don't have to name it noodles. Everybody <laughs> double click it, and we can open up the yeah, instrument yeah, editor. Yeah. Um, my apologies, sorry, that was open on DPCM. Um, you can open it up anywhere, um, but if you open it up on DPCM, it'll actually be to this set to this tab. Just turn it over to 2IO3, because we're talking about melodic instruments at the moment instead of percussive. Um, so you'll see some things here that uh, are blued out at the moment. That's volume, arpeggio, pitch, high pitch, and duty noise. Um, don't be intimidated, we don't actually use a lot of these as much, but they can be used, and I'll explain how they work. Um, am I doing okay on time? Doing pretty good on time. Um, volume is literally, it's just as much the shape of the instrument's noise as much as it is the loudness of the instrument's noise. And let me try to explain. If we put, uh, if we put 15 here, the maximum volume, and let's play a note. I'm, I'm gonna hit C on my keyboard. Okay, so that's that. Um, uh, let me turn it down to one. Let's listen. Different, right? So that, uh, so yes, does this directly correspond? You can drag it with the mouse as well as typing it in, by the way. Um, does this directly correspond to the loudness? Yes, but you can also, can you add f multiple ones? Can I go five, six, seven, four, two, five, three, seven, nine, uh, 54? 54 is not a number. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, do I, can I go eight, four, six, two, five? Yes, I can, and it'll sound like this. Oh, that's not so bad. Um, <laughs> see, we're learning together. Um, so, uh, if you, but think about it, everybody. Think about how an instrument is being played. Think about your favorite instrument. Something like a piano is, uh, oh, if you've got headphones, it's okay if you have to play. That's cool, too. But um, it, you can also put in headphones if you want. Uh, you don't feel obligated to. Um, um, think about how your favorite instrument sounds. A violin is like it's it's got a lead into it. The the full volume of the note is not played specifically when the note is being played. It has the shape of it has a lead into it. Something like a piano, you hit the key and then there's a little bit of reverb, so then it trails off. Um, think about the shape of your instruments and how you want them to sound in correspondence with everything else in your sound, and you can end up with a well balanced composition in the end. It's just as much about how the instrument is shaped as well as how it looks. Uh, so let's go like this. Uh, I'm gonna make something that leads up. Let's take a listen. Sounds different, right? Now we're gonna start with a hard lead and then we'll fade out. Um, there we go. So there you go. Um, now you know how to make a, that's the, and that's honestly a really good start at making instruments. That's a great way to start structuring. Uh, I want things with, uh, I want things with hard or soft edges. I want things that fade in or fade out. But there are a lot of other tricks that we can do to do those too. So don't worry about it yet. Let's talk about zeros. Zero is literally uh, articulation, if you will. It's, uh, I'm just gonna do 0, 15, 12. Um, let's, uh, I'm just gonna expand mine a little bit and then let's. Nailed it. Um, now, excuse me, I don't know if you heard that, but there's a little, there's a separation every time that note is played, because if you look at the instrument again, I've got a zero at the beginning. If you play a wind instrument, if anyone here has played wind or brass, then you know that we have to articulate the note by going t -t 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 -t, make the note speak a little bit, and then have a separation when every new note is played. If we remove that and we just make it 15, 12, you can probably hear that too. That separation is gone. Um, you may think that this is arbitrary, but here is my warning to you. Family Tracker does not end a note until it is being told to end it. Um, so uh, if I just have 15 like this, and I just say, play me a D, it'll just keep going forever until the sun goes out. Um, but if we put in 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 13, 12, 10, 7, 6, 0, nice. Uh, then we can go like this. And it's got a definitive end to it. Um, one other thing I want to quickly show you is that if we do a note with no ending and we play it, we can also end it by putting in a note cut. That was the thing that we put in the shortcut for. Hit that one key and it'll go like that. That horizontal line sounds like this. Nice. Uh, <laughs> so that's nice. So that is how we do that. Uh, 
So sometimes you want instruments that have long, that just go on forever, and then you can cut them at your pleasure. If you feel that you need something to end sooner than it does, you can put in a note cut. A variety of reasons. Um, arpeggio. Let's talk about that. An arpeggio is literally a broken chord. Um, it means that if you play a note and you have different numbers in here, it'll play a variety of those notes relative to the amount of semitones that it has to go up by. The, I know that's a little broad, but let me try to explain. Uh, zero, one, two, okay? Uh, zero, one, two. So that's going do, do, do. So it's going zero, one, two. It's going up like that. Uh, let's try something else. Zero, one, two, negative three, negative five, uh, negative eight, 12. <laughs> uh, nice, that kinda, yeah, it does. Um, and then uh, if you want to hold something out, you can go zero, 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 one, 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 two, 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 bam, nailed it. So that's a little bit of a slower arpeggio. So um, you, can break up a, you can break up a note that way, and I'm also going to teach you a lot of things that allow us to cheat and slip in notes in places where the time signature technically wouldn't allow it. Grace notes, if you will. Um, pitch and high pitch you don't have to worry too much about. It's literally making a note slightly more flat or sharp. I've, to this day, I've never actually used it in a cover just because we have effects now, we have effect channel effects nowadays that allow us to do that anyways. But if you really want to know, you can go like zero, one, two, three, four, like that, and then, and then we can put in a loop if we left click right here and we can go. Uh, but we have, again, we have effects channels that let us do that nowadays, but when this goes up on YouTube, some family tracker guru is going to be like, why'd you tell the kids that not to use pitch and high pitch? Or, I'm, I'm sure that someone left someone to disagree with me on that. But regardless, does anyone have any questions at the moment? Uh, oh, hi, Taylor. How do you do the loop thing? How do I do the loop thing? Good question. Uh, let me show you how to loop on duty and noise uh, in a minute. Uh, the question was, how do, I, how do I loop? We left click right here uh, on, this, uh, on this part uh, right there. You can right click it and it makes release. Um, I shouldn't have told you how to do that because you're gonna get confused. But release is basically, you can have, you can have like 15, 12, 14, 156 is not a number, uh, eight, seven, six, two. And then you can have uh, release, and then uh, seven, seven, four, two. So um, do you see how this, Taylor, do you see how, oh, I'm sorry, don't, whoa, whoa, hang on. It, Sorry, uh, please behave. I've never had this happen before. See, this is why I don't use release. God dang it. Okay, hang on. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, give me a second, people. Noodles. <laughs> uh, noodles. Home sweet home, right? Um, Basically, Taylor, did you see how when that note was being played, it was stuck on that green part for that one bar? That's because I was literally holding down the key. Release doesn't play until the key is lifted. So you have to put in, you can put in a command that says note release, and then it will play the last part of the note. I never use it. Uh, I, I think it's pretty useless, but uh, it's, it's there. It's a, it's a feature. So don't worry about it too much. Um, duty noise is literally how... When is this, uh, when is this, if we think of it as a, as a wave, when is this wave in its active state? When is it not zero? Um, so as we can see, if we go to triangle and then we go uh, square, bad, bad example. Do you see how there are parts where it, there's ups, amplitudes, and then there are just flat parts? Uh, that's when it's not active. So um, you can change the sound of the note by changing what duration it's active. Standard family tracker instruments are set to zero like this. There we go. Change it to one, sounds different, right? Change it to two, oh Christ. There we go. Uh, that sounds like the uh, Yamaha keyboards uh, on like the old Radio Shack, uh, you know, all that stuff, random thought. Uh, and then three, it sounds like, three sounds like one. They're exactly the same as far as I can tell. Maybe I just have bad ears. But um, you can change your, your instruments with zero, one, and two to get different sounds for the instruments, and then change the arpeggio, change the volume, change uh, the vibrato, change uh, all the different pieces of it, and you can come up with a wide variety of instruments. So make your instrument however you'd like. Um, oh, right, and then uh, let's show you how to make some drum stuff, too. 
Um, if any of you played the old Kirby's Adventure, you can, um, just to demonstrate a little more uh, about how things are go like that. That's got a nice soft sound to it. Um, or we can go uh, 0, 15, 14, 13, 10, 8, 0. And then we can go over here. See how it's got a 0 at the beginning and the end? That means that it's a very segmented note. So if we go over into noise, and we hit this. Wow, OK, I didn't expect that. But um, wow, it's never, oh, wait a minute. No? Hang on. There we go. I'm like, it's never done that before. Uh, that could be used for symbols. It's a quick or whatever, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and then I'm going to, nope, I did that already. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so uh, what was I just talking about? Right, instruments. Um, oh, yeah, one, one quick thing that'll be fun. If any of you have, let's see if I can recreate uh, some Undertale instruments real quickly just to show you some stupid things. No, nope, maybe it might not cooperate with me today. 0, 15, 12. Nope, okay, it, sometimes it just doesn't want to go. It might be one. Yep, okay. So if any of, have any of you have ever heard of the song Metal Crusher, the when you fight Metaton, some of you may be wondering how he did that. I did for a long time until I realized that Toby literally just took a melodic instrument and played it in the drum channel. He literally made something hiss that's supposed to purr, essentially. Um, so... That's it, that's literally it. And I was like, no way, that can't be. Yes, okay, so um, I fooled again. Um, so yeah, say again? Pulse channel? Sound like a normal, this is the uh, 01512 is what Capcom uses on the Mega Man instruments. Just a normal melodic instrument. Um, Okay. Um, enter recording mode, type in some numbers. Right. Let's show you what uh, it actually looks like when you put notes down. Everybody hit space, uh, and then we're in recording mode. Let's all type some numbers. I expect all your computers to go off at the same time. No? Okay. Sometimes they, I hear everybody typing at the same time. Uh, so let's talk about what we see here. Um, the first note, C, is literally, uh, it's a C. That's the, the name of the note. <laughs> Three is the octave, it's B. Yes, C is the, uh, Christ. Three is the octave, C is the note, excuse me. Three is the octave, because we're an octave. Three, we can, we can go up an octave. And now it's C4. C4, that note will explode. Um, zero, zero is the instrument. So see up here, we've only got one instrument that says new instrument. Oh, sorry, noodles. Part of the course. Um, and there, there are four blank spots here. Um, let's show you what those are. Um, those are actually, this is the volume section. We can, we can type in the one there, or we can type in a three there, and it'll actually, uh, it'll change the, how that instrument is uh, volume-wise. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna say that. Yeah, Mary, what's up? It's an excellent question. My answer is, is that the, this volume is now the volume for the channel until it's changed. Um, it's literally, you've changed the entire, it will now play every note that you type in here regardless of instrument or note at volume level three until it is changed again. Ian. Um, I do that manually. I'm literally, literally hitting the arrow keys, but you can go up here and change step uh, let's change it to step two and type stuff in. Now it's jumping one over, every over. But I do one because I'm old fashioned and I know it's technically uh, less practical, but it's just habit. I do it quickly. So um, I just type in a note and then hit arrow key down. Um, yeah, I, I just do that for space. Um, so three is the volume. I want to remind you, thank you, Taylor, that it's hexadecimal. So everybody count together uh, one two three four five six seven eight nine a b c d e f <laughs> that's that's ta that's that's how we count from one to fifteen um, so we can go a or f and it's literally that's a number now um, so let's do some volume things to show you what I mean there you go so um, but if we only leave one volume command right here it'll play everything at a until we change that again Spencer. How are you doing, uh, like, a hotkey to play? 
Enter. I. Oh god, I'm sorry. Enter. Enter is start and stop. Okay, I'm done. Um, right here is the effect channel. Um, you guys don't know the actual effects, and, but I did get a request to do those, so we are going to cover those today. Um, but uh, if we type in Q, that's an effect. Uh, uh, two, that's a great effect. Uh, C, en C ends the song, so let's not use that one. And uh, 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 B, I don't know what that one does. Oh, yes, I do. Um, uh, N is not an effect. <laughs> R? Yeah, so... Okay, those didn't do anything, but uh, I'll explain why that not, because we didn't fill in anything there. Um, I want you all to notice up here where it says pulse, we can expand that. See, we're, you can fit up to four effects, but that's really going to uh, increase the memory on your file, so buyer beware uh, when you use that. If you want to have two effects, if you want to have a note slide, a volume change, and something else, then open it up, and then you have different effects channels. Um, I want you all to keep in mind that uh, one quick thing, oh, do, 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 hit space, type in numbers, explain note, octave, instrument volume. Yep, okay, so we've done that already. Um, make a song. Well, easier said than done, me. Um, good job. Uh, okay, so everyone, let's, ch let's make a song. <laughs> <laughs> everyone change speed to seven up here, speed to seven. We're gonna change tempo to 150, rows to 32. Why did I, okay, 32. I trust myself. Um, and then frames to two. Um, now, as I said before, awkwardly with uh, rows, keep in mind all these are going to be the same. It's still zero, zero, and zero, zero. So everybody do me a favor, uh, provide that we're all done with that speed, tempo, rows, and frames thing, is we're going to hit the change all button right here. That means that when normally when I hit up and down right here to change this frame, it only changes pulse one. I want to change everything. See how it's changing all of them at once? That means that it'll be a whole new blank canvas for me to do the next frame on. Um, so everybody hit change all and then the plus button when you're on the second frame and it will switch it Now we have an entirely blank zero 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 for all the instruments and entirely blank zero one for all those instruments uh, Anybody not got that? Okay, cool um, Excellent. I think that everybody's got it. Uh, feel free to raise a hand if you've got a question. So um, we're not going to follow rules of melody or anything right now because I, I didn't have anything pre-planned with this. I'm just going to show you how the instruments speak to one another. Um, so, uh, oh, right. Great. Good job, mate. Uh, create lead bass, hi-hat, snare, and DPCM. Rows or spaces? Uh, yep, okay, I already explained that. Um, so we're going to make a couple more instruments, everybody, every, everybody. Rename noodles to lead slash bass. Or not. Uh, this is just so how I label them so I remember what's what. Um, and we're going to make it uh, the volume 0, 15, 12. It doesn't have to be, but this is what I like. Uh, 0, 15, 12 for the first instrument in volume. And then for duty noise, I'm going to change it to 1. This is the standard Mega Man instrument for any of you Mega Man players. Um, I'm going to keep going, and then I'll go cover them one more time if you need help. Um, make another instrument, and then we're going to name this one hi-hat. Hi-hat. Or something. This is A hi-hat is that clamshell symbol that the drummer will operate with his foot. It goes tss, 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 or he can hit it tss, like that. A closed hi-hat or an open hi-hat. It has a little bit of a rattle to it. But it's also a very short note, so we're going to change it like this. We're going to make 12, 7, 1, 1, 0. 127110 or something, so long as it's short. Again, uh, you can come up with a, whatever you'd like. Um, and we're not going to do anything for arpeggio, pitch, high pitch, or duty noise. Um, next instrument, X instrument, is going to be snare. The snare drum, as any of you marching band players will know, it's the thing that the military drum that rattles, and uh, it's got a steel cage underneath it that provides that rattle. Make a snare instrument, open it up, and we're going to. Uh, uh, we'll do eight, eight, seven, six, don't fall me directly, five, four, four, three, three, two, two, why did I type all this out? One, 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 zero. Nailed it. Um, <laughs> um, what? It doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter, <laughs> just so long as it, it has a bit of a punch to it. Um, great, and then I'm going to make one final instrument with something that you can't do because I didn't give you the files for it, so don't worry about it. So long as you know how to do it, it doesn't matter. This one's going to be called DPCM. Family Tracker, unfortunately, doesn't come with any files that have recordings, and I didn't provide a Mediafire link this time because I was a little pressed for time this week. So instead, I'm just going to show you how to add it. Um, I would have DPCM 
So that's, you just hit the DPCM tab in the new instrument. And we're gonna hit load. Um, we're gonna go to wherever you have stored, okay, maybe it just, no? That's disappointing. Um, desktop. My goodness, I didn't include it. Okay, never, we're not using it today. All right. Um, normally you would just hit, a, you'd hit load and you'd choose your sample and then you'd find the key that you wanna put it on. So I'll put it on the C key and then you just hit the left button. And then when I hit the C key on my keyboard in the DPCM channel with that instrument, it'll play the sample. Pretty simple, right? You can also pitch it and change it. So if you have a bass note, you can do sharps and flats and all that garbage. But uh, be aware that normally distorts the sample so it sounds like it's like screaming. So I wouldn't do that. Um, so we'll just make do with this, all right? Um, let's make an instrument. Uh, I've written down in these notes, write the song and pray. So let's write the song and pray. Um, okay, so everybody take lead and start typing in stuff. I don't care what you do. I'm just gonna, uh, yay. We're musicians. Uh, we're musicians. How abstract. All right. Um, Excellent. Um, and then everybody go into all the other channels. You can go into pulse two and triangle and you can add some bass lines. Excellent. Um, and then harmony. Uh, uh, no. And then I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna change the volume to four on that one just because it's gonna it's gonna be pretty. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, and then let's add some hi hats. Uh, I put my hi hats on octave three and I put my snares on octave two. That just sounds good for me. But do whatever you want. Oh, whoa. C. And then I'm going to do sna snares on two and four, I guess. Uh. <laughs> oh boy, this is going to be a real interesting song. Uh, hi, Mary. Uh, are you changing the instruments to the button? I'm not. I'm clicking them. I change the instruments like that. Um, I change the octaves with the bracket notes that we put in that shortcut for, like this. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I know you might not be done yet, but this is a song. <laughs> nice. Um, but does everyone understand how Family Tracker works with its basic channels? Excellent. You're all in, you're all musicians. I'm so proud of you. Um, excellent. Um, so let's see drums. Oh right. So the reason I use my drums normally I have a kick drum and a uh, snare drum for DPCM, and I have cymbals and snare for noise. The reason I use two channels for drums is that remember we can only play one note on each channel at a time. And normally you guys might know that drummers usually uh, hit the hi hat on every note. That's a uh, that's eighth notes, and then they'll use kick drum on one and three and snare on two and four. So that's a lot of coordination and a lot of notes being played at once. In order to get that robust drum sound, it's good to have more than one sound playing at once, which is why I simply use two channels for that. But um, you, again, you have the freedom to do, any, to do anything you want. Um, I've heard people use uh, like singing. They've recorded like little vocal bits and then put those in DPCM. They're, the sky's the limit in that regard. Um, wow, we're, we're making really good time uh, on this. Um, Drums, oh boy, we're already to effects. Wow, uh, okay, that was fast. Um, does anyone have any questions? Uh, it's okay if you don't. Okay, Mary first and then I'll, yeah, uh, hi. What exactly is the function of having a new Oh, good question. Um, because uh, we only have a maximum of 256 rows and sometimes the song is longer than that. Uh, or sometimes you might want to separate a verse into one frame. Uh, uh, sometimes you might want to separate a row uh, or sometimes you might want to separate the chorus or the bridge. Um, in order to focus on one frame at a time, knowing that, okay, the verse starts at frame one, uh, it helps us really segment it so that I can focus on just the intro or um, remember, as Taylor was talking about with her music stuff, um, music is always separated, 
by measures. If you think of those as measures, then it's very easy to segment into, if we just had, if I just had 4,000 uh, rows in one frame, I'd go, uh, where's, the, where's the melody start? Uh, where's the verse come in? Uh, scroll, 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 and then you'd be five minutes in and there'd be a mess of notes and it's hard to tell exactly where's what. So it's just for organization purposes and I forgot to do earlier, thank you, Mary. Mary, I'm gonna show you what happens if you uh, have more than one uh, frame. You just... <laughs> goes right into the next one so that's how we uh, that's how we know what's what uh, yes hi yes great question are, what are the limitations of DPCM that's excellent um, <laughs> they are going to sound very bit crushed very 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 bit crushed and they are going to be very short the general rule of DPCM is that the higher quality sound you want, the shorter your sample is going to be. Um, and at best, at highest quality, which, out of honesty, if you turn it any anywhere below best quality, um, it's generally, oh, excuse me, when you're importing a sample, I should say, I should uh, preface that. You can import a WAV file and use that as a sample. Um, it'll give you a menu um, that shows you what is your quality slider and what is the length of it. Um, the highest quality will get you a little less than one second of pure sound, um, and best will sound like a garbled kitten, but it'll be like a second and a half. So normally that's just like boom, or ksh, or something small, or with Tech Mobile you just hear touchdown, like that's one second long, you know what I mean? Uh, so um, the, the limitations of DPCM are generally length, but creative people uh, will often take a long thing like uh, uh, hey, you can do it, hit the target, or something like that, they'll separate, hey, you can do, and then play them as separate samples at different notes. Um, I'll actually pull up some of my, I'm sure I used that at one point. Um, actually, should I just pull up, uh, they will know our names, so yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, no, not on my lap, it's on my laptop, sorry. Um, so let's, uh, da -da -da. no, behave, don't it. Okay, just, okay. Yeah, um, let's just do you will know our names, family tracker. So this is, uh, this is an example of that, uh, Coatless Carl taking my views. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm just kidding. Um, if you look at this DPCM right here, you can see that I've got, bless you, you I've got, um, oh, do, oh, okay, D and C. So I have a phrase at the beginning that says, I'm really feeling it, and it is broken up into, I'm really and feeling it. <laughs> <laughs> Take a listen. Uh, I'm really feeling it. It literally sounds like that, so that's that. Um, uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, so now um, that is the basics of Family Tracker. Congratulations, that was a lot faster than I thought, but that's okay because um, we're going to cover effects now, which is what people wanted. We've got effects, we've got, and also advanced stuff. I'm going to break open some of my old covers and we can talk about some of the trickery that I used to get things that we shouldn't really get. So effects, um, everybody go to your lead instrument and put down a note. I'm gonna put C, oh, friendly C. Um, let's do the 4XX effect. 4XX is vibrato, everybody. Um, vibrato is when you sing and you can hear an opera singer go, la, do you hear the wavering in my voice, la, like that up and down a little bit. Uh, it's The note is literally vibrating. I'm a horrible singer, I apologize. I should have had Taylor do that, but, um, uh, you can put in vibrato to make a note have a different feel. So let's listen to 400, which is 00 is it not being active, that's its dead state, if you will. No, it's just being held. Now let's change it to 44. Sounds different, right? That's it. So it goes up and down. The, the thing goes like that. <laughs> um, so now, um, to, to make it quite clear, the first note. Uh, Let's change it for the sake of clarity to be four, five, six. So four, four XX is the effect. Five is the speed. It is operating at a speed of five in which it vibrates. Six is the range in which it is vibrating. So if I put uh, four, five F, which is the highest. <laughs> So it, it's really, it has a, it's vibrating to high things and low things, you know, it, it, the range is higher. But if I set it to 4F5, which is now a speed of F and a range of 5, it's vibrating very fast. So um, 
I'd advise you with, uh, as my music teacher told me when, back when I played trumpet, uh, vibrato is used like a spice. Uh, it can flavor a, a, a piece of music, but too much of it will just make it taste like spice. <laughs> so so be, be careful. Um, I love to use vibrato, so I'm a giant hypocrite. Um, <laughs> Uh, that is the 4XX effect. Um, a AXX is volume changes. Let's do, let's play a note with AOO. Again, uh, if it's zero, zero, it's in its dead state. Nothing's happening. <laughs> Nothing, just the note. AO2. <laughs> Fade. So that's called a diminuendo. Diminuendo? Sorry, not Latin. Decrescendo. Oh, th thank you. Decrescendo. And a crescendo. Uh, oh, Catherine. Uh, you could add a zero at the end of its volume on the instrument editor, or you could just go like this with a note cut with uh, the one key. Like that? Oh, or you could go like, that. you mean like this? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like that. Um, oh. The question was how do we uh, make a staccato note? And we could do that with articulation, or we could do that in the instrument editor, or simply a note cut. Um, so A2O is, oh, no, wait, I'm sorry, I said it. Set it at a low volume, like one. Yeah, there you go. So now you guys, it's like, oh, Taylor isn't a wizard. He was just using these tricks all the time. Get him. Uh, oh, right. This is the kicker. Everyone forgets this. Um, let's do A02. <laughs> and then we'll type in some more notes. Wait for it. Oh, no. There's, there's no sound in the thing. What are we going to do, everybody? Uh, can anyone guess why? No, you already know. Oh, do you already know? <laughs> Did I already tell you? Yeah. I know. <laughs> oh well. Can anybody? Yeah, Catherine. Does the effect um, keep applying itself until you change the effect? You've got it, and it's already yeah, yeah. permanently. Remember how I said that the volume, the vol when you set a volume for a note, it's not changed until you reset that volume. Catherine, you're exactly correct. The effect lowered the volume and then didn't change it, so it's at a volume of zero. Nothing's going to get played. Mm -hmm. So what we have to do, and this is what's going to make a lot of you groan, is. We have to reset the, the volume to a new number that's not zero and also hit A00 because that stops the effect. Watch what happens when I don't. <laughs> <laughs> that was normal. If, we re if we reset it. There we go. Um, that kind of sounded doo -doo 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 -doo, like a little uh, thing. Uh, so that's that. Uh, we can do that with uh, volume. Uh, increases or decreases? Hi. The sharps, the sharps and the flats? Excellent question. Um, uh, so those are the keys above uh, Z and M and Q and P. So if you follow me on the keys, uh, Z, Z is C, S is C sharp, X is D, uh, uh, D is D sharp, and E is E, and V is F, and G is G F sharp. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. It's it's like that test where they're showing you uh, where they're showing you names of colors in different colors. It's like it's like the your brain age is 72. Uh, yeah. So um, and I, and I'm singing, which I can't do at the same time. So go me. That was pretty intense. Um, so does that make sense? It's just the keys above. Uh, literally follow it like black keys on a piano. <laughs> Ow, ow, that was too high. Um, oh man, this is, I'm having a lot of fun with this lesson. Um, so uh, more effects, oh boy, um, I might run a little over, forgive me. Um, C is jump to next frame. Uh, I have no sense of rhythm, this might be. Nailed it. That's not bad. And then C, if I hit C00 right here, it doesn't matter what I fill in right here, because C is the command to jump to the next frame. Uh, great. Um, whatever. Um, I don't think that's right. Uh, but you can see how it cut off this frame early, everybody. You can see where it hits the C. Oh, C stops the song, idiot. Why did I write that down? I'm sorry. C is, what is, is it D? There we go. God, I'm an idiot. I can't believe I wrote that down in my notes. C is stop the song. <laughs> D is go to the next frame. You've got a good teacher, everybody. <laughs> C is C is stop. So like a blue stop sign. Um, okay. Um, uh, 
Right, P, PXX. So I'm gonna show you why Famous Tracker doesn't like to play, play the same note in more than one channel. Can you hear that? It's like, uh, it's, it's, it's very grating and it, it's got that shrill, uh, harsh machine edge to it. It's so screaming high. Yeah. Shatter the glass, all the windows. Uh, okay, that's enough. So, um, what happens if you do need to play two notes that are the same? The answer is you use the P effect. P is fine. P is stands for fine pitch, almost as if I told you something to ignore earlier. Uh, so let's play a C and a C here. Listen carefully, everybody. Same note. And now I'm going to change to P81, because P80 is the standard. That's the middle. P81. Can you hear it? It's different. I'm gonna play it one more time for you. Um, different? Different slightly. Does everybody hear it? Yeah, so that actually makes, what we did is we actually made pulse two slightly sharper. We raised it just a hair, and for the machine, just a hair is enough. It counts it as a different note, and it doesn't have that clashing on the synthesizers that we had earlier. Um, subtle, but it makes a difference, especially in some of the things I'm gonna show you later. Um, Glissandos. Uh, glissandos are, uh, well, let's show you rather than tell you. Um, Q01. No, Q04. Dramatic. Yeah. Uh, glissandos are from the fr French word glissé, which is to glide. It's literally glide from a note to another note. Four designates that we are going up uh, four semitones. So it's. Uh, Christ. Uh, So it's going, and when it hits that note, it'll stop gliding. Um, so you can also the second the first so the second number designates how many semitones it's going up by. The first number designates the speed at which it's going up by. So everybody listen to Q04. Got it. Now let's listen to Q34. Faster. Um, this is nice because if you've ever heard a diva sing the Star Spangled Banner, they add a lot of these to their things, so now you know how to do that. Oh, say, can you see? Or whatever. Uh, oh, that's fun. Um, oh, we could do the same thing with R, too. Um, I hope it's R. Is it R? Yes. Nailed it. Nice. Um, da -da 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 -da. First speed is slide, second is notes. Yep. RXX. Okay, those are the basic effects, but remember that if you Google Famitracker effect list, there will be a wiki page for the Famitracker wiki that contains a full list of every effect. Half of them don't really get used anymore, but you're more than welcome to experiment with them. Uh, and I've told you about the cutoff turnoff rule with effects. Uh, that includes the volume resets on AXX. Excellent. Um, let's talk about expansion chips. You might be thinking, gee, Taylor, this is all fun and dandy, but there's a really limited range. Uh, I just wish I had two more channels and a sawtooth. And I'd say, that's really specific, but funny you asked. Uh, uh, oh, geez, what did I do? Um, what I did is I went to module and then properties, and then I changed the expansion to sound. To further reiterate, um, the, the NES, or the Famicom, as it was known, wasn't really big on having new hardware drilled inside of it, but it was very good on having extra chips being put into the cartridge that gave that specific game a different sound palette. Um, some composers were literally just like, I need, to, I need more sounds. I want to do a new song with this. So instead, they went to their boss and said, have we put another sound chip in here? We could give me another, some more capability, and I'll write more stuff for you. And they said, sure. Um, different companies did this. Konami did two, the VRC6 and the VRC7. You'll know the VRC6 from the Japanese version of Castlevania 3. You'll know FDS. Uh, FDS is also, you guys know it as the original Game Boy chip. It's what was used in Pokemon Gen 1 and 2. Um, MMC5, if I remember, was Mike Tyson's Punch-Out, or maybe something else, I don't remember. But it's what I always use, because the MMC5 does not alter any of the existing uh, sounds of the 2A03 that I showed you. Um, if you listen to the VRC6, let's make a new instrument in the VRC6 channels. See how it's different? It says VRC6 up here instead of 2A03. Um, it, it'll sound different. Nailed it. Um, it'll sound different. So I prefer to have that genuine NES sound, but I do like a little bit of capability, so I prefer the MMC5. That's not to say that any others are wrong or different. Um, VRC7 will give you FM channels. Um, 
I don't really work in these, so I, I, uh, let's just, whatever. Oh, these, okay. <laughs> Patches, uh, this is our halfway house between uh, NES sounds and MIDI sounds. You can, you want a clarinet? You've got a clarinet. Uh, you want a soft bell? That sounds horrible. Uh, you can add patches. You can. I know people that make custom patches. God bless them. That takes a lot of. Uh, oof. Ow. Uh, Yamaha. Much. Wow. I didn't even know some of these were. Uh, but if anyone is ever like, uh, I'd like a percussion ensemble thing, then this is your thing apparently. Choir? Uh, chorus. Okay, that doesn't sound like a voice. Uh, but anyway, um, you can try things with that. I don't like it because it, to me it just sounds like a Sega Genesis. I, I, I use Family Tracker. If I wanted something else, I'd use Milky Tracker or Mod Tracker. I use Family Tracker because I like that NES sound. And to me, this is a little off the beaten path, but more power to you if you, if you like that stuff. Um, good for you. MMC5 and then the Namco. God bless them. This is probably the most alien one. Uh, you can recreate Pac-Man uh, with this perfectly, I've heard. Uh, there's a video somewhere on YouTube. And the Namco was also used in um, a lot of Japanese games that Sumsoft made that didn't get released to the US. I'm ranting. Let's get back to the main focus. Uh, actually, nope. Oh, that's the end of expansion chips. OK, done with most of the lesson. Um, all right, so this is uh, literally labeled in my lesson as advanced stuff. So we're going to do advanced stuff now. Uh, all the things, all the secrets have been laid bare. Uh, and I'm going to show you some of how of what I do and how I uh, basically cheat on some of my my uh, abilities. Um, all right. Oh, triplets. Okay. Um, triplets are Taylor. Can you help me on this one? Basically, like when when a, a pattern of notes, when a series of three notes doesn't exactly fit in uh, your rhythm, then. In a smaller space, yeah. Because, yeah. Uh, so, like with quarter note triplets, you're usually trying to fit what would normally be like if you're in four four and you want to go uh, quarter note triplet, you're trying to squeeze three beats into two beats. So you have to slightly shorten the value yeah. of each beat. Thank you. For each note. It's essentially yeah. So it's shortening the notes inside a smaller rhythmic space. So um, let's take a listen to the gold silver crystal surf theme. This is a cover that I did, and let's take a listen and see if we hear anything unusual. <laughs> time. Let's take a listen. I'm, I'm That's pretty cool. So we did those with an effect called GXX. That's called a note delay. I literally delayed the note by two arbitrary units of measurement clicks, let's call them, uh, and then four clicks so that there's a little bit of delay. Um, I'll play it one more time for you. So it's da 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 even though the, the rhythm is one, two, three, two, two, three, which is waltz tempo, just as Taylor was saying. Let's sound what let's hear what it sounds like if I delete them. Uh, this is gonna be a little awkward. And then I'll put it back with the melodies for So it's different now. Um, if you play it again with the originals. That doesn't sound too good. So that's that. Um, you can use G as a note delay to make different rhythmic patterns that wouldn't necessarily fit within the normal structure. That's uh, that's that. Um, we're doing good on time. Um, double hi hats. So um, right. So for this one, um, Sonic and Knuckles is a soundtrack that has a lot of dance influence. Actually, the Michael Jackson actually wrote a bunch of tracks for Sonic 3 and Knuckles, but he had some falling out and it got discredited somehow. Um, you can read up more about that. But there's a lot of 90s influence in this with, with uh, a real sense of bass and rhythm. And I listened to the original song. It sounds like this. You get the point. Um, and I listened to the original drum track, and I was bored out of my mind. It was like... So I thought, how can we make this more interesting? So I tried something that I saw online that was, um, if we look at the hi-hat right here, I called it hi-hat roll, you can see that it's different slightly. I added a 943 hi-hat, which is tss, and then a space of three zero, so that's 943000, so tss, a pause, and then 4210, so it's tss, tss, tss. So it's the space of two hi-hat hits within using one instrument key press, if you will. So it sounds like this. 
there you go. So then, if we combine, if we isolate that, uh, ignore the snare in one sec. Yeah, that's why I was that. Yeah, I've muted the the noise instrument right here. I can wait. Say it again. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Spence. Uh, the quest, the question was, how do you mute it? You double click, like right here. So I'm double clicking, or I can single click to mute certain things, or I can double click to isolate it. Or my apologies, I didn't hear your question correctly. Um, so now we've got noise isolated. Let's listen. That's actually pretty interesting. So now if we combine that with drums. That's a lot more interesting. So d feel free to experiment with, don't be afraid to just make a direct copy of the original song, because that's super boring. Uh, I combined two drum tracks in the second part of this to do, um, no. See, this is what I get for making long songs, right? Um, yeah, so. so we combine that original double hi-hat pattern with the other pattern in the second half of the song to make an entirely new drum track. And then when you combine it all, it's really messy, if I remember correctly. Sounds like this. Yeah, so that's that. Um, don't be afraid to experiment with that. You can do different things with uh, symbols like that. Echo and reverb. Um, I haven't done an aquatic ambiance cover. Why did I write that down? Um, let's make one. <laughs> let's make one really quickly. Um, not the entire thing, just the melody. Why did I write that down? Um, Family Tracker, Noodles. There we go. Uh, let's just show you. Oh, I know what I wanted to do. I wanted to show you the different ways in which you can make reverb and echo. Uh, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Not bad. Uh, duty noise, too. Okay, um, so the first note. There we go. So. Excellent. Um, I'm going to just slow it. One, zero, two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Much better. Um, okay. So those are the first two notes. It goes do 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 do. Now the whole aquatic ambiance in Donkey Kong Country is very soft. It's very uh, thoughtful. It's underwater. It sounds a little murky and mysterious. So how do we have that sense of echo and and reverb uh, with Famous Tracker, which is a little limited in the amount of sounds we can produce? So this is single channel. I'm going to expand it a little bit. Sorry, so that we have a little more of that. Not bad, not bad. Can we expand it? Let's do double channel. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. We're going to put every other note on a separate channel. So it gives the note, so the existing note when the new one is played does not block out the other note. Let's take a listen to this. That's not bad actually. Um, I'm gonna put a little fade on this so that, um, so that it's not so. That's pretty good. It actually kind of sounds like that Zelda dungeon theme. Um, let's expand it. <laughs> let's do triple channel. Um, uh, yeah, da, 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 da. Um, uh, yeah, of course. Um, so actually, let's just just do quad channel. S screw it. Uh, this is going to sound so murky. Uh, oh wow, actually that's not too bad. So that, that's one way to do it, right? So you can expand the amount of channels and then that gives you a, a little more range and a little more echo. And when each note has its opportunity to speak, it gives the piece more volume. Does that make sense? Excellent. Um, P81 echo. Oh, you're gonna like this one. This is Phoenix Wright. Um, da -da -da, desktop. Um, oh, by the way, you can find all these files. I have a, a YouTube channel where I upload all these. It's youtube.com slash instant train. If you look at any of the videos, there's a media fire link to every song I've ever made. I release all my music for free. All the source files are free. You know, it's all free. So just go and grab a copy of that if you need it. Um, this song sounds like this.
I don't know if you noticed anything particular about the Pulse 1 and 2 channels, but they actually look pretty f similar. As a matter of fact, they look almost identical, except for the fact that one is slightly ahead of the other. Um, that's because I made, the, I made the melody echo to give it a little more space. Um, like that. Um, if we isolate one, you can see how it's, uh, it's at volume C, and then we have volume 3. which is softer, but also a little slower, so it's almost like shouting into an echo chamber and having it reverberate a little bit back towards you. Combine the two, and... Uh, it actually sounds pretty good together. But, like I was saying earlier, I tuned it with P81, so that if I removed it... It's clashing a little bit, so... Adding P81 will make this one slightly sharper, but just so much that the human ear can't really hear mu much of a difference. Um, and then it'll make everything flow together nicely. So that's an example of echo. Um, a lot of people use this, actually this was used to death, I'd argue, on Shovel Knight on certain places. Um, so that's that. Um, DXX cutoffs, nope, I already explained that. Um, okay, cool, 16th note arpeggio cheating. Oh boy, Brinstar. Um, Okay, so let's take a listen to this, you know this song. Pay attention to Pulse 1. Do you notice anything? Uh, there, there are more notes being played than what's listed here. Um, let's see if we can find the exact note. Oh, there it was. It was right here uh, with the instrument 04. That's because uh, the the triplet, if you will, right here didn't fit, once again, with um, the amount of spaces I had with the rows. So instead, I had an arpeggio that did it for me. It's 0, 1, 0, negative 4. So it does a little bit of a trill, almost, between the notes. So you can do that. Um, that's a little bit of cheating, but it does work, so, hey, whatever works, right? Um, right, this one, Sticker Rush Symphony. Okay, so um, this one was very complicated because this is a cover I did of uh, Grant Kirkhope's arrangement of David Weiss's composition of a Super Nintendo version of Donkey Kong Country 2's Sticker Brush Symphony, <laughs> used in Donkey Kong Land 2. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's so good um, because it, it took... Uh, this huge song with a, a huge amount of sound and this kind of thoughtful, sad feeling, and it made it, uh, he used echo and, and volume fades and things like that in very creative manners, and it gave it an even more mournful and pensive feeling, in my opinion. It felt very thoughtful. Uh, but I threw in a little something there that was a reference to the Super Nintendo version that wasn't possible on the Game Boy version. Well, it could have been, but it probably would have been a pain. Um, there's a certain part where you hear a bit of a filter sweep where it sounds like and it kind of fades in and out. Um, that wasn't there on the original version, but I liked it so much on the Super Nintendo that I wanted to include it in this arrangement. But the inevitable problem with Tracker, there's not enough channels. There's never enough channels. Uh, so I had to come up with a way that still used this right here.
while still adding those other parts with two pulse one and pulse two channels. I needed to include the filter sweep. So I did it with, in a really, a way that surprises me that it worked, uh, let's say. Um, I included it with volume, I started the filter sweep, stay with me, at volume two, turned it up to volume F, and then slowly interlaced it back from nine, six, four, two, one. So it went up and then it went down, faded in and out just like it did with the song, but while also in every space that the filter sweep was not playing, re-included the original part back at volume A in between the volume changes from zero, nine, F, nine, four, and one. <laughs> uh, so basically it sounds like this on, on pulse two. It, it sounds like it shouldn't work, but then you listen, and it actually kind of works. Uh, so, yeah. You can trick the ear in a lot of really interesting ways, but it was just a, an example of really having to play to your strengths and really understand the, the hardware and say, if I really want this thing, I'm just going to have to include it somewhere somehow. Um, and I've been doing this for two years, and it's been, it's been really, really great. Uh, it just started out as a, a fluke thing that I did uh, for fun because I wanted to know more about video game music and then now I've, I'm talking with people that are trying to get me to write stuff for their YouTube channels and some dude for Steam Greenlight and it's, you know, it's, uh, it, there's such a, a power to the medium and I think that we've seen lately with games like Undertale or uh, Downwell or any of the other chiptune games that even though there are, there's a true limitation to this medium but there's an amazing amount of strength in finding finding the right arrangements to have a really it's just a, a well arranged family tracker piece or a, a chiptune piece in general is so tight because it's really making advantage it's taking advantage of literally every square inch of, of real estate you have and you really have to make every note count and i think that that's it lends itself to a certain strength of melody and and cohesiveness that we've somewhat lost in today, a lot of today's video game music. You know, now that we've got an orchestra, why not use an orchestra on every piece? Um, but I think, you know, in games like like uh, Shovel Knight or Undertale, we've seen that people still connect to this this medium in a really meaningful way, and it still resonates with a lot of people. And uh, just like how we how we listen to old Pokemon music and we get all nostalgic because it reminds us of when we were I don't know playing Red and Blue on the playground, or maybe that's just me. But um, uh, I have one more thing to talk about. Uh, this is the final thing, and we're right on time. And that's the nature of arrangement. A lot of people ask me, uh, well, if I'm, uh, if I'm doing covers of songs, because I do a little bit of writing, but most of my, my work is through arranging other things for Famitracker, why bother? Like, are, are, isn't, it just, um, isn't it just something that's not yours, someone else wrote it, it it's not really yours, what's the point? And uh, my answer to that is that I'm not trying to necessarily, it's more about it's more about finding your own way to tell that song rather than recreating it exactly. It's much more interesting for me to try to find a new way to do the melody or the harmony or the bass or to add a new part or to uh, change the sound when it changes from that medium to, to the medium that I work in and uh, to find a new way to bring about appreciation for that original song is really what we're doing with arrangement. Um, arrangement dates back to um, Western classical music, and um, we used it so that we could um, perform orchestral music or, or big ensemble pieces with a piano. We could do it in a living room, or we could do it amongst friends or family. We could bring those songs with all of the all the important parts intact, and still have it be appreciated in a new light. Um, so. I would say in terms of arrangements, it's really the joy of the joy of finding a new way to appreciate that song. And that's what I would encourage all of you to do um, is to, to if you're covering a song, if you're writing something new, if, if you're being inspired by something that exists, um, find what really makes that song special or what resonates about it to you and try to make that speak in a new way that's meaningful. And I think that if you practice and uh, you practice and you always try to have fun and you always try to learn something new, whether it be uh, good or bad, um, then you'll never go wrong. So that's my lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, right on time.